You're listening to The Vent Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vent Podcast. My name is Brady, joined in studio with the hurricane force winds raging outside my door by uh, Billy Glanko. How you doing, Billy? Nice. Good. Good. Back to the weather chat here, huh? Um, it's terrible. Yeah, you have to talk about is... it like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's freezing by LA standards here. We're getting to the low to mid 40s every night, so it's pretty nippy. But yeah, no, I'm really excited to be here this week. And we have a one of my favorite guests, Vince Anter, coming back on for V is for Vino. So I'm really excited to get to our our chat with him today. Yeah, it was a it was a great conversation with Vince. He's always, I mean, he has s- so much perspective on the industry that we just don't have because he gets to do so much cool travel, which is, yeah, it's always great to hear from him. And he has a lot of really cool episodes coming up on his channel this year. But we don't want to bury the partial lead, which is, well, we'll let you tell the listeners sort of the news. What do you have for us? <laughs> yeah, no, it. It seemed anticlimactic, but yeah, I've officially passed my WSET diploma. So we got the results. Thank you. Yeah, Clint. From the last exam. Actually, you know what? There is a button I've found here. Hold oh. on. We can actually, you can actually add clapping on the side. Yeah, do here. that. How do we do so that? Let's see. Oh, here we go. It's loading. It's loading. So let's <laughs> just loading. have it go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so yeah, it, it's been a, a little over two years going through the process, which is about as long as they thought it would take, I was hoping to get through a little faster, but you just mm-hmm. some bureaucratic slowness in grading, but it's really exciting. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited and I'm going to be applying to the master's program, hopefully here in the spring when it comes on, when it's nice. available. So basically you apply, like I mentioned last year in May, you can start the process and then hopefully you'll hear in the, I, I think you hear by September. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty pumped, but now I'm going to officially put the little moniker on my on my LinkedIn, on my name. Nice. So everybody knows. So that'll be great. Yeah. Watch the opportunities roll in now, industry wide. Yeah. May, well, make it, it easier. It's, it's, it, <laughs> yeah. No, I was actually telling me, she's like, what, what matters or does anything change? And in theory, if I were to be applying to wine jobs, it would actually really help to have, have this. It's like the top qualification you can have outside of masters on the side of things. And, very few go on to get their masters. I think I read somewhere there's, as of like last spring, there was 12,500 people with their diploma in the world. Nice. Which sounds like a lot, but it's not that much in the grand scheme of things. So yeah, so it would help if I was applying, but I'm I'm happy here at Finn. So won't be applying. So it doesn't impact my day to day, except for not having to study for any of these other exams again. and Just wait till the masters. So that'll be fun. Well, it'll help us get a more high profile guest for the podcast, which is a, which is a bonus. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, that'll be, that'll be fun if I do get into the master's program, regardless if I do very well, because now we've heard of multiple people who have stopped because they failed, which is <laughs> slightly intimidating. As long as I don't get divorced or yeah, or just fail, that would be great. Kind of like Joe Fatrini said, one in three people get divorced. I don't know about those stats, but. And if I do get in less, by that time, yeah, I will less, be married. So, <laughs> Acor- yeah, according to Joe, less people get divorced if they do a master's of wine than like the average population. So, <laughs> but still, yeah, which, which when you put it that way, I was like, oh, nice. So it helps my chances, but still one <laughs> actually have to do it. Yeah. I was like, wow, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people are getting divorced these days. But yeah, so that'll be exciting. So, I, I, yeah, it was got the results yesterday. So we'll be celebrating this this weekend. We'll go to a nice meal. On uh, on Saturday, we have a, like I was just ex- talking offline about an impromptu trip to Palm Springs. I've never been. Mm-hmm. Apparently, there's not a lot to do, but we're going to one of the restaurants you you have to go to while you're there, according to them. So I'll report back next week and see how that goes. Well, our, like Billy said, today is Vince Enter, who we've had on the podcast. This is our third time having Vince on, and he is the host and creator behind the web TV show V is for Vino. So it's a wine informational travel show centered around culture, wine, travel, wine education, really just trying to make wine education more accessible for folks. 
So Invince will intro much better than I just fumbled through when we get into the interview. But yeah, it has a really broad perspective across the wine industry. And I think really has a good pulse on what folks are looking for when they're exploring wine, learning about wine, getting into it, tr- sort of getting their feet wet with unique regions around the world, which something that we pointed out as maybe a trend for 2024, Billy, of people getting more accustomed to some of these sort of like unique and off the beaten path regions in terms of wine exploration. And no one does that better, I think, than Vince of introducing people to them. For sure. Yeah. Now everybody knows we're big fans. Like I got to meet him in person for the first time in December. He's just a great guy. He does, you know, really travels to some interesting places and all of his episodes are so so entertaining, both for people who are really into wine and those just like wine curious or even those who just like travel shows. So I love all his videos. He's a great guy. So it was awesome to be able to catch up again. Nice. Yeah. Stay tuned. We have Vince Anter. All right. We are here with three time guest Vince Anter from B is for Vino. Thank you so much for joining Vince. Hey, you guys aren't sick of me yet. That's uh, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm actually I can't get my fill. I just met you for the first time in person last month at your Chile release party. That was really a quite a time. Yeah, that was a, a special thing. We never did it, one of those release parties like that. And to get to watch people watch the episode, watching you watching me, as they say, like that was really <laughs> cool because most of the time I release an episode and it's just on YouTube and I just get some comments. But to see people watch it live was really special. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was like the Grammys. Watching the video of it was like watching (laughs) some, yeah, it was like an after party at the Grammys. You looked great. I thought everyone looked great and that looked like the wine was flowing. So that's cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And obviously Billy and I, we got to finally meet in person, which is really cool. And you brought some friends and it was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. No, they had a blast too. Also, I don't think they really drink any Chilean wines before. So that was nice as well to be able to introduce them to some quality ones. Just random question before we dive in more. Are you doing more events in person this year? I know somebody just won the the grand raffle for your Vino VIP, which is also an in-person event. Yes, I plan on it, but I don't have anything locked in yet. I want it now that we did that first in-person event of the episode release, I would like to do an episode release party for every episode. Now, will it happen? It's it's one of those things that it's a pie in the sky to do it every episode, but the reality is launching is I'm focusing on so many other things to get the episode out that it's like a bonus. But that being said, I do think it's important. What we want to do is foster a community and relationships, and that does that. So I'm hoping for every episode we release this year, which should be four, we can do an episode launch party. Yeah. Wow, that would be cool. Yeah. Speaking of community, like just sitting there waiting for the show or the episode to come on, I met like Sarkis. I don't know if that's how you say his name. Yeah, close. Sarkis. Yeah, from the Code to Rowan episode. So that was just like really cool. Oh, yeah. Who knew? Not only are they fans, but people who are in them might also be there. So who knows? And uh, also people like my wife a lot. So sometimes more than me, I would say. They, <laughs> they know her. She makes some small appearances on camera. Sometimes she's usually behind the camera, but I'll put some little behind the scenes things. So people know her too. So she's always shocked that people want to get to know her as well. Oh, yeah, that's nice. I know May Yi wanted to meet her or my fiance when she came. Cool. Do you want to, for some of our, our listeners, some people may be familiar because it's your third time on, but others may be new. Do you want to explain a little bit about what Vias for Vino is and how it's evolved over the past couple of years? Yeah, probably some people at the beginning have no idea what we're talking about. We So what Vias for Vino is, it's a wine, food and travel television show that was born out of my desire to make the wine education process more fun, more accessible. I took a lot of inspirations from a lot of the travel shows that I think we all love. Bourdain. I grew up with diners, drive-ins, and dives on in the background. I loved Alton Brown as a kid and Good Eats. So I took some inspiration from some of those shows and said, how can we apply this to wine and wine education? And what we came up with was this show that started as like half-hour shows, and now they're full hour-long, hour-long episodes. They're all free on YouTube. I think that's something that I always stress is really important. We're on a bunch of platforms. We're in some American airports and we're on Amazon and some Roku channels. But most importantly, and our main platform is YouTube and the content is always free because I wanted to provide this free TV show for people to 
go through their exams, or even if you're not doing a sommelier exam and you just want to learn about wine casually, that was what I wanted to produce and I wanted it to be accessible. And so what we've evolved to is something that not only combines wine and wine education. So we go to a new wine region every episode. We actually physically go to these places all over the world. We explore the kind of maps and the history of wine there and what grapes they make. But we also go taste with winemakers. And then we go to local restaurants. And even now we do some fun travel things. Like we did the Chile episode and I have a little segment where I go horseback riding. Because to me, wine is about what makes it fun, I think, to most people is wine is about the whole place it comes from, not just the juice itself, not just the bottle. And so by showing that, hopefully we can encourage people to either travel to these places or at least vicariously travel through our show. Yeah, it's definitely it's taken on a sort of the like you said, a, a full experience with the cooking stuff as well. I have done some content with cocktails, too, in the past and even I think it's been cool how you've taken that free long form content and built other content streams around that. There's all kinds of stuff that folks can consume from you. Yeah, across food, drinks and travel, which I think is really neat. Yeah, I appreciate it. We definitely we have some other th segments on the main show is the travel show. But then we have some other things on YouTube. Some of them are just wine education videos, how mm -hmm. to become a sommelier or how to buy wines at the grocery store. And then some of them, I have a little mini cocktail series. I have a mini cooking series. Those are good, like where I play around. I have the travel show that's not going away. That's the core, what people come for to watch and learn. And then the other series are just fun things that I have a passion for and maybe other people will too. What are some like maybe demographics or part of your community as it's grown and you've developed some of these other content niches and little side projects, as you call them. How has your, your viewer base changed? Have you seen the demographics of that change at all? What actually happens is that the travel episodes are a gateway to the smaller content, not the other way around. Oh, I initially okay. thought I would bring in other people through that content. But what I found is that because there's so much cooking content and there's so much cocktail content out there, People won't find mine first. There's people who specialize in that and quite frankly are better at it than I am. I love to dabble in cocktails. I worked at pre-prohibition style bars for a long time, but the niche of wine and wine education is a lot less crowded. And so that's, I think, why there's such a demand for our show, why people really resonated with the show is because not a lot of people are doing what we're doing. And people find the wine content first, and then they'll dabble in the other stuff if they like those particular things, wine, food, what have you. I think that makes a lot of sense. I was just looking at our YouTube numbers the other day, and it's mainly, it was like a vent channel. And then we had like a podcast as like a link. And one of, we still get like 2,000 impressions a month on this video I did with a Vegas Sicilia rep two years ago that was just talking about a Vegas Sicilia collection. But there's just so little out there in terms of some of these specific producers or regions that like people are still watching it or looking for it. Yeah. One of the things I am going to do this year is take a lot of our, instead of focusing on other series, I think I'm going to spend some time. I'm finally going to cave and take a lot of our content and put it in short form content. I've avoided it as long as I can. And I do think that there is more need and less people competing in the long form space. So that's why I, I liked it. I'm good at it. But I do think we're missing out a bit by not putting out enough short form. So that'll be the, the transition this year, I think. We'll put out a little more of that. How short is short form? Is it like chopping like, things into five or ten minutes or the last, minutes? Like the vertical stuff, the tick, the anything, reels, YouTube shorts, the vertical stuff. Some of it will be repurposed from the content we have. Some of it will be new stuff. But that, I think, if done right, will hopefully bring some new people to the channel because it'll still be in the wine space. I think you're 100% right. And I think that's where a lot of people are consuming content, even it's longer on, on Reels on Instagram, as well as TikTok. It's a lot of work, but good luck. I, I know you guys can do it. So <laughs> Vince has, Vince I know has that's why I've been avoiding it. Yeah. You guys have a big leg up because like you said, it's essentially, or isn't essentially, it is a TV show and the production quality matches that, right? And so when you can take really high quality, long form content, it makes it easy to easier to chop it up into high quality, short form content. So I think that's a, a probably a leg up that you guys have. I hope you're right, because I like I said, it is a lot of work. One thing I wanted to avoid personally 
was becoming a quote unquote influencer where I had to produce content 24 seven, seven days a week. I just don't like that as a lifestyle for me. I don't like the pressure of having to post. I post our, we only do a couple travel shows per year and I get to make them perfect before I put them out there. I prefer that. Some people like to be a little more down and dirty and just hit record and go. So whatever works for you. But for me, I don't want to spend my whole life just sitting, making short form videos all the time and be like, oh, I didn't do one today. I got to do one. For sure. For sure. All right. Do you want to talk about now? Let's you've done. So you've done four full seasons. We're on season five. You want to talk about a couple of the episodes that are out from this season and then what we have to look forward to the rest of the year? Yeah, 100 percent. Since we talked, we had already released Virginia. Mm-hmm. We had probably did I release Southern Roan? Maybe not. Not yet. OK, so we did Southern Roan, a really important region in the wine world, a great place to hunt for value if you're listening. Obviously, there's the big heavy hitter names in the Chateauneuf the Pops and such, but there is a lot of wine produced in Southern Rhone, so a lot of great value. And it's a beautiful road trip if you ever decide to get to the, the south of France. And you're so close to Northern Rhone and Provence and Languedoc, so you can do a whole lot of the wine regions if you decide to ever go there, which is really nice. So those came out. Then we just released Chile. Another great place for value, but more importantly, a really surprising place to visit as far as how there's obviously some small producers and boutique wineries, but there's some really beautiful estates down there. You can get a very similar experience to a Northern California wine trip in Chile. And I can't tell you how many people watched the Chile episode and were like, oh, great, we're going. We booked our trip. And that makes me so happy because I don't think people would have considered Chile as a wine trip a lot of them anyway, before they saw that there is that infrastructure there. We went to some really nice restaurants and hotels, some stuff that I think people don't necessarily associate with Chile. So that was really fun. And obviously the wines are are super high quality. And if you like new world kind of richer style wines, they're so great, especially because they have a lot of the characteristics of Northern California Cabernets and Merlots and such, but with a lift and a freshness that is very unique to Chile. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to highlight that as well. I think there's like the ripeness you get from a lot of California wines, but there, I don't know if it's just because of their, the relation to the Andes and, and it all obviously depends where they are, but some, there's a freshness in some of these wines, whether it be from the ocean or from the mountain influence that I think is really unique. And I have a, a random idea that I keep claiming. And I told every, my friends that day, I think the Chilean Sauvignon Blanc is just as distinct as a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. There's this weird balance of herbal freshness, but yet ripeness that perfectly straddles for me Sancerre and New Zealand. Um, Yeah, so I totally agree with you. So we did one winery near the coast where we did Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. And the Sauv Blanc Sancerre can be great, but it can be sometimes too linear, too tart, not develop fruit enough. And then sometimes you go to Northern California, and it's too ripe. It's all peaches. It's even getting tropical, which I, I like my Sauvignon Blanc to have that zing. And then New Zealand is can be super gooseberry. So you're 100% right. It's very distinct where it doesn't pull too much from any of those. Like it takes all three of those characteristics and blends them together. It's really nice. And you tried that Sauvignon Blanc when we were at the party, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And I was like, ah, checks out. Actually, that was on one of my the four flights of three on my diploma exam for the, the wines of the world. One was a Chile flight. And I, I could tell like, all right, I got this one. Cause one tasted like the Carmenere, one was the Sauvignon Blanc. So I was like, we could be nowhere else. The rest was like a cab, but cool. So where else are you headed? I think there's a couple more really yeah, interesting so, places on the list. Yeah. Two of them are, are filmed. So I've got two in the can, as I say that I just need to sit down and edit. And that'll be my next few months. That is Languedoc. So Languedoc Roussillon which is in the south of France near Provence, but a little more west. And what's nice about that region is it's like Provence without the height. Provence has a lot of money there and a lot of, you know, big resort kind of things. And it can be a bit pricey. And Languedoc's a bit more untapped and a little more authentic. And so that's a really fun place. We filmed with one producer while we were there. So Some episodes we feature multiple producers once in a while. If I think I have a good producer that embodies the region, we go with one producer. And so we went with Gerard Bertrand and I got to know their family and a little, they have a huge lineup of wines from many different places in Languedoc. 
So I thought they were a good representation of it. So that will come out in March is the goal. And then I am very excited because we filmed in Lebanon right after that. So I did a week in France. I came back and then I immediately went to Lebanon. And that one has a special place in my heart, not only because I think that story is important to tell. Lebanese wine is ancient and yet at the same time new. The tradition of winemaking is very old there, but they've had to reinvent themselves many times through hardship and through war. And most importantly, I am half Lebanese. My great grandparents immigrated from Lebanon, came through Ellis Island and all. And so I have a lot of connection to that place. I got to bring my brother along on this shoot. First time out of the country for him. So he came with me. It's a really special trip that I think will hopefully translate to a very both entertaining but also emotional episode. Brady, I have one note and then I'll let you hop in. First, I've read Gerard Bertrand's Nature at Heart. So I think we're, and I oh. thought, and he seems like quite the character, but I, I really think that book is interesting. Just from what I've read, it's just like an interesting point of view on his spiritual nature, but as well as the wine and, and biodynamic or sustainability. So we might have to talk afterward to get him on the podcast because I've <laughs> he sounds like a guy who would be really interesting to talk with for an extended period of time. Yeah, he's he is a character and he's he has some fun stories about how he became got into biodynamics and it was basically for his health essentially and he really believes it and he's on the forefront of a lot of the practices that are now taking root in other places in Languedoc too. He's a special guy. And his whole family's really nice. I got to hang with his daughter too who's involved in the business and they're all really great people. Of the two of the three episodes of the season between Southern Rhone and Chile which destination were you most taken aback or impressed by the geography of the place? And like the, because I, I imagine just based on footage seen and photos of different parts of these regions, pretty dramatic landscapes in both of these areas. And as part of a wine region, is that did one or the other kind of stand out in that sense too? What's amazing about Chile, and we barely scratched the surface, is that it is so long. So you have so many different types of geography. Now, Chile is defined by the push and pull of the mountain air meets the coastal air from the ocean. But then on the extremes, you can go north up to the desert, the Atacama Desert. And they're one, they're making wine in that area. But two, it's supposed to be just stunning. And we didn't get a chance to do that. And in the second episode, we definitely will if we do a second episode in Chile. And then if you go south, you're in Patagonia and you're in like the Arctic. So it's it's really amazing. And then you have everything in between mountains the whole way up. The Andes Mountains go the entire length of the country. When you're in wine country there, it feels very much like California. I couldn't not comment every time. This feels like this feels like California. Every time I look out the window and, and then you're at these wineries, it feels very similar. So that's fun. But the cool thing about Southern Rhone is the history that's involved in the geography. So the landscape, you'll see these towering old castles as you drive through and you'll see the rocks in the these big rock walls. And they look like something out of Game of Thrones where you have a castle on top of these big rock walls and you just you can see the soils, both different and both very stunning kind of in their own way. Building on that. For me, the Southern Rhone, like you said, is, is very similar geographically to the Languedoc, or I guess in my mind, like the Southern Rhone and Provence are similar. Is, is that the case? Are they pretty like in terms of geography and topography? And then after that two part question, what is Lebanon like? Because in my mind, I just picture cedar trees because that's. <laughs> yeah. So that obviously that area in southern France isn't too far different because it really is a small area comparatively. I think France is. I think around the size of Texas, I might be making that up. But anyway, it's not huge. You're not going to get a dramatic difference. But what you do get is a difference in microclimates. Like if you're in Provence, you're getting the influence from the ocean a lot more than if you're in kind of the Rhone area. And especially as you get up to northern Rhone, where you're a little more inland, but you get the wind coming from the north, the mistral winds, and you get the influence from the river. And then in Languedoc, a little bit of everything because it's so huge. It's actually, I didn't know this until I started researching for the episode. Languedoc makes more wine than any wine region in the entire world. And that's a crazy statistic for a wine region that people don't really know very well. 
any other wine region that has a lot of volume like that, I think people drink on the regular. But I don't find myself reach. I will now, but I didn't find myself reaching for Languedoc wines very, very often. And so that's an interesting area to explore because, again, so many microclimates and different styles of wine and at a killer value. They're, the wines there are, are dirt cheap for the most part. Now they have, they're slowly spending a little more time and effort on quality in that area. And so they're like Gerard Bertrand, that's basically their whole thing is we need to stop being a commodity and start really representing each different plot of terroir so that it's not just ubiquitous wine across the entire giant wine region. And so that's a focus. And then second question, Lebanon. So Lebanon people, it's the Middle East, right? So everybody thinks it's a desert. There's no desert. It's actually the only country in the Middle East without any desert. It's all ocean and mountain. It's a really skinny country, similar to Chile, just on a much smaller scale that is influenced by the water. And then all the vineyards are planted at altitude pretty much. So you get some of the highest altitudes of wine planting in, I think, the Northern Hemisphere in Lebanon, which really, again, brings that freshness similar to Chile because they plant on the mountains. It's very similar. The wines are very fresh. Is the, Interesting. Is the cult- the culture of like those regions and the producers that you met with and such like that. And I'm sure like for the episodes that haven't come out, we'll get to see some of that interaction. But are there any sort of notable differences between the culture of these places around wine that you pulled out? In Lebanon in particular, it's a it's an interesting conversation about wine because so the country is about 50 percent Christian, 50 percent Muslim, and the Muslim population doesn't drink. And for a long time, when it was under the Ottoman Empire, they banned they, alcohol entirely. Before that, they have some of the oldest winemaking tradition because the Phoenicians, who were all in that area, were some of the first exporters of wine. They were the first to make wine into a business. They weren't the first to plant it, but they were the first to like really make it a robust part of their economy. And so now the culture has come back, and you will see they take their wine, even though they make a very small amount of wine in Lebanon. They take it very seriously and they are focused on quality for the little bit that they produce. They are very much focused on the quality. They're very proud of their wine culture. They're proud that it persevered. They also very much, we're going to touch about this a lot in the episode, but I don't think Lebanese people, they have this resilience to them. I'm half Lebanese and I know they like to venture out and immigrate to other places and they're very entrepreneurial and they're very. Um, persistent through adversity. And at the same time, they don't really want to be known for making wine in spite of. They want to be known for making good wine. And it just happens that they've persisted through a whole lot of things that have come their way. So I know that's vague, but it'll make more sense when you see it in the context of the episode and you see the full history of what they've had to go through. And then this, the warmth of the people, that is something that you will I hope feel because we felt it when we were there, just remarkable, kind, Mm -hmm. welcoming people. And you feel the, you do you feel the momentum? Like, are they, do they have the energy of the global momentum that's coming into some of these regions in terms of interest Are like how much awareness and excitement is there about that both in Lebanon, but also in a place like Chile, maybe, which is maybe a little bit ahead. Yeah. So I think the thing that, And we can talk a little bit about kind of trends and where I think everything's going. One of the things that Lebanon has is a lot of what people look for right now in wine, which is they want something that is authentic. If they're using a lot of French grapes in Lebanon, but they have some indigenous grapes that they're pushing, but they're very big on dry farming. They don't, they try to to focus a lot on that. And and it's something different. I think our, our generation in particular is always looking for things off the beaten path. If you're going to a and Lebanese food, I was trying to explain to him how big Lebanese food is right now in America from chains like Kava to nicer, like trendy restaurants. It, like in Chicago, we have Abba, which is one of the hottest restaurants in the city. And it's a Lebanese Mediterranean restaurant. And so that's really cool. And I was trying to explain to him how big it is here. And to see that you go to a place like that and you get. Lebanese wines to accompany your meal, I think that's really special because for a long time, Lebanese food was seen as maybe like cheap. You might get like cheap falafels somewhere, right? But now that you're seeing it elevate in America, 
you're seeing Lebanese wines also be featured there. And at the same time, you'll talk to the Lebanese people. They don't want to be only associated as you can only have Lebanese wine when you have Lebanese food. They are, like I said, they're proud. They want to feel like they can stand toe to toe with any other wine region in the world. And I, I believe that they do. So I assume you, it'd be interesting to, to hear about the producers you went to, because I think everybody who knows any one Lebanese wine producer would know Musar, um, Chateau Musar, like we've talked about. And we actually just re-aired our interview with Bartholomew Broadbent, the son of like Michael Broadbent a couple of weeks ago. And his favorite wine in, in the world is Chateau Musar, which is interesting. Do you like make a point of trying to show people that there's more than just that? Or how do you balance that reputation, but also showing the rest? Yes. So exactly. Muzar has this reputation and will tell that story because they were the first ones to basically export wines during essentially Lebanon civil war. The head of that family, the patriarch kind of said, listen, we're not going to be able to sell wine in Lebanon because there's not going to be any extra money for wine uh, while we're going through a civil war. So we need to branch out. So he took the wines and put Lebanon on the world stage. That being said, Musar makes a very distinct style of wine that is completely different than every other Lebanese wine. They just have their own thing going. Now, they're some of my favorite wines on the planet, and we go to Musar in the episode, so you will see them. But at the same time, we go to three other producers. We go to Chateau Cassara, which is the oldest winery in Lebanon. We go to Ixir, which is a brand new winery in Lebanon, more modern. And then we go to Close and Toma, which is a family owned, very humble. We have four very different wineries in this episode and all of them have different philosophies on what they want to do. Like I said, Ixir is a bit more modern. Close and Toma is working really hard with indigenous grapes. And then Kassara has this amazing winemaking history and this huge portfolio. So we're going to four very different wineries. And when the episode comes out, you'll see just how the philosophies and the styles vary as much as any other wine region. And I think more more typically, you'll find the wines less distinct in general than Musar because they're just, their wines are so different. If anybody knows those wines, they have this, both their white and their red are just made in completely different styles. The white has these insane honey, earth characters, rubber, lamb, anything under the sun that you could think of, you could probably find it in Chateau Musar white. And then the red, is done in this kind of interesting, I always say those reds to me have this overdeveloped fruit character but with the body of a lighter wine, the body of an 11, 12% Pinot Noir, but then this kind of dried, really robust fruit character. Again, you can get kind of anything under the sun. So those wines are very distinct. And then I would say the rest of the wines are more traditional. They will be similar to wines that you can put your finger on, but with a little twist, like you might get why flavors in there like Kirsch or Rosewater or things that you wouldn't get from other places in the world. And that's why I think the ancient world, as it's called, makes interesting wines because it pulls from a little bit of the new world style and a little bit of the old world style and does their own thing. Interesting. Yeah, Go I, ahead, I picked up my first bottles of the Musar white and the red. I haven't had them yet. I was going to have it over Christmas and was sick and was with people who didn't care and so didn't end up opening them but that's yeah, it's good to hear those things it sounds really yeah excited to get into that excited to see that episode billy that's yeah, decant, all i want to say but decant that white for an hour and don't serve it too cold and to the family themselves gaston he would tell you have it almost like red wine temperature <laughs> that white is really unique it's wild too because it's 10 percent alcohol but it drinks like this really robust. The closest thing I could equate it to is maybe like a older Chenin Blanc. It drinks like really rich and honeyed, but yet it's really light in, in alcohol. It's, it's crazy. It's an anomaly. That's, do, why do, it's so, that's why it's so distinct. Do they age both their whites and their reds there at the estate? Did you get to have any older vintages or how does that, did they talk about how they perform over time? Yeah, we had a we had an older vintage white, not at the estate, but at the dinner. We have a big group dinner at the end, and oh. it was a showstopper, to be oh, that's sure. Cool. And the nice thing is that if you get Chateau Bazaar, they also age before they release. Like, you're yeah. already getting a wine that's at least five years old, I think. So they, they won't release it until they think it's ready, and then obviously they age really well on top of that if you go longer. 
How does it compare to a white Rioja, like some of those Lopez de Heredia whites that can age for a little bit? That's a good call. That's a good, like I said, an old Rioja or an old Chenin Blanc, I think mm. are the closest you could compare Chateau Moussard white. But again, it's it really is a distinct experience. And the cool thing is that if you want it, you can have this experience for, I want to say Chateau Moussard white goes for 60 bucks, 70 bucks if you mm-hmm. get a newer vintage. That's a really reasonable price to try what is arguably one of the most exciting wines in the world. Sometimes to do that, you would have to spend hundreds. And that's across the board in Lebanon, whether it was Cassara or San Tomas or Ixir. All those wines are a really killer value. Unfortunately, Lebanon's going through some insane hyperinflation and some really terrible economic crisis. But what that does mean is that the wines are very affordable. On the note of, actually, this isn't on the note of anything. Think, thinking about some of the things you were talking about before reminded me, we just basically, our last episode was on, on wine trends for, for 2024. And one of them actually was lesser known regions continuing and lesser known varieties continuing to emerge and be more accepted in the broader community. This was from like a 750, so like a trade, trade to trade kind of article. What have you, like of all the places you've been, I feel like you've been a lot of places that are people would either say are really interesting or maybe lesser known, or maybe some people just think of as more affordable. I'm thinking of places even you've been to like Mexico, you've been tasting over to Rio Spices and get some like Albarino. What are some of the places that you've maybe been to and tried to tell everybody about it first? And now you're seeing more and more people drink it and be like, ah, that's exciting because I was so excited when I went there. Yeah, I remember when I was, when Beaujolais was cool before it was cool. And now all the crew Beaujolais are $30 and up. You used to be having them for 15 But So that was one of them that now has been adopted widely. Let's see, places I've been that I've seen people adopt. That's a good question. Because honestly, mostly for the show, I've been to a lot of Western Europe and a little bit outside of it. And my goal is to keep going, right? To go more in, in South America. I want to do South Africa. I want to New Zealand, Australia. We haven't done any of that yet, right? But I do think that you'll see more and more people getting excited about Eastern Europe because there's a lot of winemaking countries in a very small area. You've got Hungary, you've got, I would say, Germany outside of Riesling. Germany makes a bunch of great wine that isn't Riesling. You've got Switzerland, a lot of people tell me make great wine. Georgia, the ancient world, that whole area, Slovenia more and more. And so I'm hoping that all those areas will start to pick up steam. They are, I already see them more on wine lists, and I think that'll continue to happen. The other trend that I think it's less about the place, but I just think you're going to start seeing more and more people not even focused on vineyard practices, because I think that gets in the weeds. Is this organic? Is this sustainable? Is this biodynamic? What does it mean? But people want to know what's in the product. And I think you're going to have more people willingly in the wine industry disclosing if they're, that they're not at, basically that they're not adding anything because they're not going to put it if they are. But I think you're going to have more people willingly just saying, hey, listen, we have nothing but grapes and in our wine because so many wineries will put additives. And our generation is really focused and worried about what we're putting into our bodies, chemicals, preservatives, et cetera. So I think you'll see that happen, not through, I don't think laws. I don't think they're going to legally require it because I think the liquor lobby will fight hard to avoid that but through voluntary disclosure. Yeah, one of the other trends in that article was regenerative agriculture or viticulture is the new sustainable or organic just because people are wanting to explain even more about what they're doing and adding in. But going back to my question, I I think you have been to a few that I I think I feel like I've seen you do like an Oregon episode. I feel like I've seen Oregon Pinot Noir and we we were actually just up there. so Chardonnay is taken off. And then also like Portugal in general. I know you have both Port and Portugal or the rest of the country. But I feel like those wines are finally getting a little bit more shine. I feel like I've seen them more around, even though the varieties are impossible to keep track of, even for somebody who studies wine. Yeah, the key with Portugal is not to focus on the varieties and just focus on the location because there's too many. But yeah, you know what? You're 100% right, though. I haven't. I've seen Oregon for sure. And it's funny because I feel like at the time I went to Oregon, I was already like not behind the curve, but I mean, already established. But I think that's because I'm in the wine space. Mm -hmm. I think for people not in the wine space. Yeah, Oregon's still kind of new because they're much of if you're not in the wine space, much of your wine exposure. If you live in America, it's probably only California. And you have seen Oregon like 
you, I would be shocked if I go to a restaurant and I don't see an Oregon Pinot or an Oregon Chard on a list. And I guess that is a relatively new thing. So that's a good call. I would say, unfortunately, some of these regions just struggle with some of the import export rules. Like Mexico is one that produces some fun wines, but it's hard for them to get them to America, especially because it has to go through California for the most part. And California is a bit protective of their own wine. So they make it a little tough and the Mexican government makes it tough. Same thing with Lebanon, like they're going through an economic crisis. So they're hard, it's hard for them to export and get wine distributed. I talked to Canadians who say the exact same thing. A lot of people have told me how wonderful Canada wine is, but where am I going to get Canada wine? Besides some ice wines, not much is exported. And so I think a lot of these regions, that's the main struggle is how do we get these wines to consumers and have them actually know we exist? And that's what I try and do with the show. That's the goal. And get them even beyond the importing, exporting, like getting them to consumers at a price point where they're willing to kind of branch out. Take right, a it has to be accessible enough where they can make that decision over something that maybe they know better. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I read something that said, hopefully, like Vir we went to Virginia and I said, I read an article that said a little bit, you're seeing more and more Virginia wines on lists, maybe not a ton, but they might have one or two. And if you go to the kind of up and coming restaurants, you'll see it more because they're obviously more willing to take chances on unknown regions, but also because they're looking for value for their guests. To me, a good restaurant, a good wine list is looking for value. They might have a couple blue chip wines on there, but they're looking for the fun stuff. And those more often than not come from off the beaten path regions. Yep. Agreed. You think the average U.S. wine consumer can name another U.S. wine region outside of California? Or not that, not naming an AVA, but, <laughs> yeah, but can you they, think they yeah, can say Finger they... Lakes or like New York or Oregon? This is where like my, yeah, this is where my bias, like I'm too far in, I'm too deep. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody I talk to is like in the sphere of trying to learn about wine. If they yeah. found my show, it's because they already had an interest in it. But that being said... Like when we put out the, yeah, the Finger Lakes in the Virginia episode, people, a lot of the comments were, I didn't even know this was right in my backyard. Hmm. And so that's a cool thing. Again, like going back to the core ethos of the show, if I can get people to do that and try that, try something new, that's amazing. The one that keeps copping up now domestic is both Michigan and Texas. And I think hmm. I'm very bullish on both, but especially Texas, just because you have so much wealth and industry flowing there right now. By nature, it's going to produce people who want to do wine country experiences. All these people from California who are moving to Texas, they're going to want that wine country experience. They're going to start going to these regions. It's going to build them up more and more. So I'm pretty bullish on Texas, at least from an economic standpoint. I don't, I'm not crazy familiar with the wines yet. I hope to learn more, but I think no, without a doubt, that industry is going to grow. Yeah, Texas and Michigan are definitely, I'm deep in the wine industry call outs. <laughs> Meanwhile, the average consumer is just getting on to, like we said, Oregon and passive verbals. <laughs> so, yeah, that's crazy to me, but I, I'm, I'm sure you're right on it. It's just so funny to me because those are like a lot of those regions are like things that I'm I'm past, not because they're not good, but just because I I did them when I trained. You start there. Everybody starts there. Right. And then you move on to the other things that you like. And I don't often go back to those regions because there's just the beautiful thing about wine is how many there is to explore. and I'm so ignorant on so much of the wine world too. I know a fair amount and I have so many people who will reach out to me from places and countries that have wine industries that I know nothing about. I've had a lot of people from Brazil reach out to me and say, we're making sparkling wine that's decent. You need to come down here. I've had a lot of people from India reaching out to me and saying, our wine industry is growing. You need to come check it out. And I, I hope to one day. Yeah. Yeah. I think going back to Texas, the ones I've had, and it's weird, like the growing regions, like that northwest side of things, like closer to Amarillo, which I never really thought of. Like I was in Austin and I was like, oh, I want to go to a winery. And I was like, oh, they're like, none of the fruit is actually really grown here. And I was like, oh, that's sad. But it was in they're Texas. They're fighting though. that. Yeah. yeah they're fight that's the big fight in Texas. That's been happening a bit. I think you're going to see it be much stricter laws because they're trying to, if you want to establish a real industry, you can't cheat people like that. Yeah. And then the other thing is they're the varieties they're choosing. I don't know if it's just because somebody's like an Italian file, but the, I've had like multiple Alianicos from Texas. And I'm just like, 
what an interesting choice to start with like out of out of everything it's cool. yeah i think that dry hot climate they're looking they're gonna go mediterranean yeah v- varieties for sure i think that and spanish and portuguese i think it'll be tough to grow too many of the, the french varieties in texas they're gonna do it because they have to they're gonna need to sell cabernet sauvignon to get people through the door but i think you're gonna find that those more robust varieties work better in a hot climate like that you know, the, the western side out there though, does get sneaky high altitude a little bit. Like it gets over like oh, a thousand go. feet. Yeah, you slowly ease up there. So I only know that because my dad and I, when I was moving to California, stopped in Amarillo. And then in the morning we tried to work out. We were both running and thought we were just like, what's wrong with us? Are we like out of <laughs> shape? And then it turns out we were like a thousand feet above sea level. And ah, that'll just slow us down a little bit. But I did have one question just on macro wine things that you're seeing out there what kind of wine trends or like styles do you think are going to be popular moving into the new year like one of the other things this article's commented on was co-ferments and for me i'm seeing a lot more of those out here like i feel like co-ferments are the new piquette not that piquettes were ever really a thing but i see them all over the place out here what are you what are you seeing yeah i think low alcohol wines not intentionally made low alcohol but just wines that are lighter and fresher, which are the wines that honestly pair a little better with food for the most part. I think those are going to continue to have some buzz around them because you're seeing so many people concerned about their alcohol intake, including myself, just from a health perspective, as I get older, right? Even though I'm in the wine space, I'm a little more conscious of it than I used to be. And I think a lot of people, if they're not going completely dry or just being more conscious. And so Lighter styles of wine, I think, will continue to to grow, especially because the restaurants, again, those kind of trendier restaurants push them. And if you look at our you know, the younger generation, instead of going for big Italian red sauce and steaks, where are you going out? We're going out to Asian food or South American food or other different cuisines that kind of call for lighter wines. So I think you'll continue to see that. And then... What else from a trend perspective? The cold ferment thing is interesting. I don't know if I buy that's a big enough niche to see a widespread adoption. It's cool, but I that's almost like the field blend thing, which is fun to see, <laughs> but will it ever become something normal? I don't like why adopted by a lot of winemakers is like, hey, here's our field blend, here's our cold ferment. That I don't know. Yeah, the co ferment is like three rungs lower in public view than Texas one, <laughs> probably. Yeah, I think most people don't know what co-ferment actually means. <laughs> yeah. So, but people will like accident- said, to Billy's point, I think people will probably accidentally drink more of that stuff than they currently do. And then they'll drink it, they're like, oh, this is interesting, turn it around and be like, what is this? And then that's how that happens, I think. Yeah, I think you'll see the co-ferment on the same wine list that have the natural wines and the orange wines, yeah. which I hope, I love, I think orange wine is, it's, this isn't a new trend though. I don't know. Maybe it is compared for most people out there. The orange wine trends is going to continue to grow because so much of them are also natural and because it's new and interesting. And because those wines are cool, like good orange wine is awesome. I think where it got a bad rap was a lot of people were making faulted natural orange wine. And then people were like, oh, this is gross. I don't like this. So if you go back to making properly produced orange wine, especially if you look at, and there's a lot of places in America doing it, but then obviously Slovenia and Northern Italy, some of those are really magnificent wines. So I hope that trend continues to grow because I think those wines are really fun and different and interesting. Is there anything else that you pull out just like from your own hat of trends that you imagine coming forward in 2024? And also last note, before you answer, uh, why you think you definitely need to go to free Uli slash or yeah. that, that whole area we visited and it, it's a blast and you're right. The wines, even in just Slovenia as a whole are amazing, but right there in that free Uli and Slovenia border, crazy Berta. Yeah, no, I, I would love to get there and do an episode there uh, for sure. Or maybe it's like the orange wine episode and I bop around to a couple places it's famous for it. That could be cool too. The other trend and I don't, it's not a trend and I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you've seen all the articles about how wine consumption and what demand for wine is down. You're going to see companies start to do anything they can. They already are to try and get younger people to get into wine because our generation, the younger generation, they're in the cocktails and beer and they're finally like 
it was a couple years delayed, but you're seeing the production of wine and the demand for wine go down. And I don't know how you make wine, how you get people into wine. That's hopefully what I'm doing with the show. And I, it's weird because I know so many people, younger people who are into wine. But again, this is my bias because I work in this space. I think if you go to a random party of people 45 and under, most of them are not big winos. So how do you do that as a company? You focus on, like I said, they've already tried to focus on sustainability. I see so many people focusing on, let's make it trendy. Let's pair it with music. Let's make cool labels. Let's do diversity initiatives that we think people will like. I don't know which one will actually resonate with the audience. Maybe it's a combination of everything, but I think you're going to see more and more of that effort from especially the big conglomerate wine distributors, but smaller ones too. I think a lot of that would be around like experiential kind of stuff. I know the whole idea of a concept restaurant was, is already an old thing. Destinations where people go and say, okay, I'm here for the vibe and the experience and hanging out with my friends. And it just so happens that this place that we like going to maybe mainly or exclusively sells or like that's what you drink when you go to this place that we like to go to. And so whether that's like a, a bar or a club that kind of thematically focuses around those wines or wineries becoming more sort of weekend destination spots, which I think a lot of them are trying to do. Yeah, and even maybe just opening up tasting rooms in major cities away from the winery, because what wineries rely on heavily is their wine club. That's where they have the biggest margin. They charge the same for the wine if you're part of the club, but they don't have to pay a distributor and a retailer a cut. And yeah. you had COVID shut down all these wineries. People stopped going to them. And it really hurt them. And so you have to find a way to exactly make it an experience. Uh, I tell people, if you're looking at starting a winery, unless you're going to be in a top tier A-list wine region, distribution on a national level by just selling wine is really hard. You need to make it yeah. so that people come to your tasting room. You need to hold weddings, maybe have a restaurant, make it that whole vibe because that's, I think, your path to success for the most part, wine, the wine industry is really tough and competitive. And it's, so I, I 100% agree with you. It's startling too, like how few, if you go to a winery, you can't get any beer. If you go to a brewery, you can't get any wine. It's like, why is there not more cross-pollination or joint, it's like joint ventureship between some of these producers? I could see a winery that has had some success acquiring like a small brewery and co combining some of that experience because I think that those demographics are a little bit split and I know like I don't drink beer and I can't tell you how many breweries I've been to with friends where the option was Sprite or water <laughs> to, to drink outside yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you have, you're in the two peas in a pod, just the, the fermentation processes. And I've been to some wineries that have a little side project where they're messing around with a cider or a beer or something like that. So that's right. Yeah. That's a good call too. Maybe you'll see more of that kind of cross crossover that'll hopefully that like you said now you can bring everybody you don't have to bring just winos to the winery that i think that would be very smart right right yeah hey billy anything else here before we wrap up i know we're pushing on time a little bit i know this has been great thanks for coming back on yeah yeah i, I appreciate you having me we didn't even really get into which is fine because nothing's set in stone but we're filming a couple more this year too oh yeah let's touch uh, on this real quick yeah just quickly i the only one that I'm really willing to say right now is Burgundy. Burgundy is going to happen. Nice. So oh, awesome. that is one awesome. that needed to happen for a long time. I can't believe you haven't done it up till now. Burgundy is going to happen. And then I am hoping for a few others that will film this year and either come out late this year, or early 2025. So either way, we're going to get four episodes, full four full episodes out this year. And in addition, we have all this bonus content, the little videos we do. And then we also have our VIP club, which is a lot of fun. It's this kind of cool community that we put together. Billy, you're part of it. You get to get behind the scenes access, early access to all the videos. We have Zoom tastings where everybody gets to hang out once a quarter. And we talk, we chat and we do a wine of the month. So there's some fun things like that, too. So that's that's my agenda for the year. Awesome. I'm looking forward yep. to it. I'm that's excited cool. to hear what the mystery places are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I am too, because they're not. That, the reason I won't say it is because they're not set in stone. <laughs> so as soon as they are, you'll be the first to know. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us.
All right. That was our interview with Vince Anter. I hope everybody got excited about the episodes that are out and are looking forward to, like I am, the episodes that are coming out this year. But we will be back with another interview next week. But if you are following Vince or any of the Vias for Vino channels, we have given them a special promo code for the Vint Marketplace. So go follow his channels and you guys can see what the promo code is. So until next week, cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.